Thank you for joining this session. Uh, this is data exploration with smart mapping in ArcGIS Online, also available in Enterprise. I'm Jennifer Bell. I'm a geographer on the Living Atlas team in the software products division at Esri. And we work a lot with smart mapping. This is my mentor colleague, Jim Harris. Jim Harris, nice to meet you. I'm a geographer as well. Uh, pleasure to be here and glad you came out on a Friday. You all survived dodgeball. No one took anything to the face or anything. You all look healthy. <laughs> I see we have uh, various levels of commitment to this uh, presentation. Uh, this young woman in the front has to walk all the way across the stage with a slow, steady gait to communicate she's done with this session, whereas uh, the least committal person is right near the door. <laughs> but I know you're going to be captured by what we have to say, so we're not too worried about it. <laughs> all right, so let's begin. Let's do. All right, so here's the session description that I'm sure you've read and hopefully brought you here. But smart mapping is a really great way to like, quickly explore your data. So what I like about smart mapping is it rewards you for exploration. You're trying different things. You're, seeing, you're exploring new ways, um, inspiring new ideas for your maps. And it very quickly and instantly improves the quality of your maps. So in this talk, we're going to share what smart mapping is more specifically. Uh, there's four other sections after that, mapping where things are, what things are, uh, mapping how much, mapping relationships in your data, and lastly, making maps when the data does not exist. All right, so the first section is what is smart mapping? Smart mapping supports your ongoing work. Any problems that you're facing now with your mapping uh, most likely can be solved visually and uh, statistically with smart mapping. And these are solutions that developers can also leverage. So it's also found in the JavaScript API. So what we're going to show today is more the map viewer, uh, the out of the box look at smart mapping. But every smart mapping component that we show has a JavaScript uh, element. So these are really beautiful maps. Uh, they might catch your attention, uh, tell a great story, but why? So why are we here to learn about smart mapping? What can smart mapping do for our maps? Uh, they, they you know, honor the data. They show it in the best way possible. And it can help uh, create change, uh, show where a problem is existing. Any other reasons? Yeah, I mean, we notice year, after years and years of making maps in various platforms and various pieces of software that um, sometimes the software rewards your curiosity, and sometimes software can punish your curiosity. And what I mean by that is we would find we'd make these great maps. We thought they were great. We thought we had the colors right and the right pop-up and the right data available. And we publish it up to a server. Maybe eight years ago, we would build tile caches out of it. And that would take a certain amount of time. And then we'd take it in for review. And somebody would say, I like it, but. And it's the words they said after the word but that caused us to go, OK. what?" what Give it to me, what, what? And famously, one time our director said, your pop-up, it needs you know, percent black population. You can't just put the count. And I'm like, why didn't I think of that? So I went back in, added a field, calculated the field, put it in, republished the services. Oh, and he wanted color changes too, of course. Recached it, published it a second time. And there was another change. So you do enough of this, right? And what do you, as the gatekeeper, of the map start to realize, I don't want any more changes, right? I don't want any more feedback, because then I have to republish this again and again. So it got us all thinking about, well, what would a software experience be like where um, it rewards you for your curiosity, where touching something, you get instant feedback, and you can show it to someone and say, are these colors acceptable? Is this pop-up acceptable? So how can we take advantage of the modern um, web GIS pattern in order to expedite the discovery process about our data and then exploit what we find. And that's where smart mapping started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really this iterative process. Um, someone, you make the map, and then you show someone, and they say, change this. Kind of like when we're coding, it's an iterative process. Does this work now? Nope. Does this work now? And so we find these patterns, and we want to make the defaults a little bit smarter so that you don't have to go through so much of an iterative process. Uh, so we have reality. 
and then we have data that represents that reality. And then you get that data, we analyze it, we interpret it, and we put it out visually, either in a map or a chart, some sort of user experience, which hopefully someone will look at and take action, maybe with a policy map or something like that. And then it, it kind of is a cycle. You know, they see the map and they say, actually, the data needs to be improved or updated, or maybe you need to analyze it this way. And so we're constantly going through this loop. Yeah, and we definitely thought at the, at the maps level, if we're getting bogged down for any reason there, what can we do to suggest changes to the software that allow you to explore your data and immediately sense, am I getting what I expected? What did I expect? And that was a big surprise. I think even for us today, we still, the first time, how many of you ever gotten the data, you put it on the map and you're like, oh, that's not what I expected. And so suddenly you're in a different world, right? You're like, well, I had this expectation, but the data is showing this. So now I get to wrestle that to the ground. I like this example. We use this um, often because um, if I say 98.6, I think uh, many of you in the audience will immediately react and say, oh, he's talking about body temperature because we have that shared understanding, right? We, we share that. How we share that, I don't know. I think my mom first told me as a kid, if you're at 99, you're going to school. <laughs> if you're at 101, you're staying home. So what'd you learn to do? come on, 101, put the uh, thermometer under your arm, heat it up, do whatever you can to get out of school. But once you have this shared understanding, um, you have a basis for analysis and most importantly for interpretation. We often map things we know, but I find we map more often subjects that we have no familiarity with at first, and we need to rely on a subject matter expert, a partner, a customer, somebody to help us understand, hey, you just gave me all this data. So what are you interested in? And for us, it's always about what kind of questions someone is interested in, and do we have a basis for comparison? Um, in this case, 98.6 is the magic number by which you can judge. If I had the body temperature of everyone in this room, and I could, if I could tell you one person in this room is running 103 degree fever right now, how many of you would want to see that map on screen right now? Heat map. Heat map, literally a heat map. And the reason why is you want to know if that person's next to you. Now, if you're relatively isolated, you're like, hey, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, but maybe the more crowded sections like, is it him? Is it her? Do I need to move? And that's what we want with all of our maps. And that's why um, those of us who are working on smart mapping, we get very fired up about um, how to exploit the value from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we had a map that showed everything above 98, it wouldn't be as meaningful. Yeah. If a map of everything above and below 98. Yeah, how would, how would Jenks classify this data, right? It would be 97 to 99.5, right? So it, there's no difference between any of those temperatures in, in classification techniques. All right, so yeah, it's the magic number, the meaningful number. We're going to see that a lot in our demos. Um, yeah, it's very quick. You can be confident about your mapping. It's simple. Uh, there's data-driven workflows. It looks at your data and provides smart defaults. And it bakes the expertise into the tools, all the things that we found mapping all these years. We put it into the defaults. So it's the democratization of data visualization. All right, so that's the first section. What is smart mapping? The second section in red is mapping where and what. So here are some examples, just the where, where is the location of these features, the X, Y coordinate. Um, let's move over to Jim's. Cool, so this is an interesting data set on the, um, it's called RNLI return of service. So when they launch a boat out to go rescue someone at sea, um, they, w they track in the database what was the reason they went out um, the year of the call, the lifeboat class, and you can kind of sort this data and start to take a look at it, and it starts to make you want to ask questions. So the way Smart Mapping helps you and your development team ask questions of the data is you can simply go in and touch a field. So what was the casualty category? And as soon as you touch it, it runs out and it checks, well, down here, leisure, people, commercial, and other. And when we built this, we thought about, well, what would you be interested in? You're probably interested in the category that has the greatest count, right? That, we've got to start you somewhere. Every piece of software has defaults. This is a smart default that kind of tells you, well, leisure is the most common type of casualty category, and commercial is uh, trailing along far behind. 
or maybe you're interested in, I'm just going to cancel out so it goes back to my original rendering. Maybe you're interested in what year did it occur, right? A lot of times when you have data sets, people are interested in how things change over time. Now, in this case, year is stored as an integer. So smart mapping, when it sees an integer, it says, well, usually people want to symbolize integers by size. But you could also do it by color. You can make a heat map. All of these are one click away. And you could do, um, I'm going to do types, unique symbols. All right, so immediately I see that we have a little pattern going on. In 2014, had the greatest number of launches, 6,900. And 2008 had the least. If I don't like the order of this legend, maybe I, I want to kind of you know, put 2016 at the top and 2015 below that, 2014, et cetera. Um, I can then choose one of these color ramps that is more sequential in nature. Since I'm reorganizing my data by years, maybe I want to use kind of a sequential pattern where red, the latest stuff, stands out on top. Does that kind of make sense? In this case, I'm just exploring this to try to understand what's going on. Um, Jennifer previously made a version where we cluster, right? So here is the no cluster version, where every one of these 59,000 dots is going to get drawn on the map. It's pretty. It is pretty, but it's not telling me anything. It's not meaningful. It's not meaningful, because a lot of the dots are what? They're stacking up on top of each other. And our job is to help bring some clarity. And one of the nice options available in online is this little cluster points button. And you can turn clustering on or off. So here it is off. And then we just slam all 59,000 points on there. Or you can cluster and then adjust the amount of clustering. So do you want very few big boxes so that these are very big clusters? Or do you want lots of clusters? And each cluster represents, if I touch one of them, it'll tell me, hey, I've got 819 features uh, represented in this area, and the predominant value of activity is sailing. So there's a lot of sailing rescues going on. I like that it's an automatically generated yeah. pop-up. But it also shows your other pop-up that you've created. Yep. Yeah. And then another pattern might be, um, what can I do to kind of tell a year-by-year -year story? So maybe I'll take this layer. And do you know about this copy option? You say, pick a layer and say copy. And uh, it makes a copy of the layer. It's just an additional reference. And I'm going to make sure it's visible. And I'm going to change this because I just want to show 2016. So I'm going to edit my filter. I'm going to add an expression that says uh, year of call is 2016. I'm going to hit apply. I'm going to be sure to rename this thing so that uh, I remember what it is. I find that by naming the layer first before you apply filters and everything, you're kind of like stating your intention um, right away. So now we have a uh, 2015 layer. And I think we turned clustering on. Yep, we did. And then I have a 2016 layer. And they don't look that much different. But if I were to build this out for each year, you can see now I could have a conversation with a developer to say, I'd like to be able to show the year-to-year -year change in calls. And this clustering method is a really good way to visualize it. Can you put that in the user interface? Here's the web map ID you need to call. It's this web map. It has all the layers I've built. And you just need to cycle through them and turn them on and off. And we often find that uh, that's a great way to kind of engage a developer and say, this is the idea. Like, I want this map to show, and it needs to have this one layer on. And then I want this map to show, and it needs to have this other layer on. And it's just start, as a good starting point for discussion. Oftentimes, we'll find the developers, application developers, will have their own ideas on, well, actually, there's a better way we could do that. And they kind of start down that path. So that's our first example. Yeah. Uh, we also have this one if you want to show it or we can skip it and go to... Oh, I just wanted to show this one real briefly as an example. You know, the pop-ups can be very informative and useful. Here's uh, all the uh, markers. If you drive around Ireland, you can find these markers out in the field. Um, you know, things that uh, look like this. And this collection, what we noticed is some of the data was stored here in the table. Um, yep, there you go. So the inscription is documented, and um, 
if there's a photo, there's a URL to it. And what we notice is sometimes there's a photo, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there's a Wikipedia, Wikipedia reference, like for Shackleton, who's peering like Kilroy just above the photo. He's got a couple of Wikipedia entries that we can link to and show. Um, but the one next door did not, and we didn't want the pop-up to look ugly, so we just real quick jumped in, and we created a configurable pop-up where this little expression says when this field isn't empty, add the word about and a space and slam the uh, link in, uh, the name, and then we'll use that as a reference here in the pop-ups structure, right? So basically this expression only appears if it has content. Because um, we've all built those pop-ups before where unfortunately sometimes their data isn't perfect and the pop-up that little part of the pop-up is empty all the time. It's annoying, right? But part of smart mapping is dealing with annoying or um, incomplete data. You can quote me on that. <laughs> so another example of mapping where this is a project we worked on where we mapped all the transportation or transit bus stops in Los Angeles. And this was the final app that came out of it. Um, we show some bus stops in purple, maybe get less than 100 people getting on the bus every day. And then the areas in green, the bus stops in green, can have up to maybe 16 buses that go by, by it every day um, with thousands of passengers. And so this is what we call um, the conditional formatting for pop-ups. So this one has a lot of buses, whereas a purple one might only have a couple. Um, so this is great, a great example of why the app is so important, because this is how it looks in the web map itself. So you've got this HTML table and the pop-up, but you have kind of a bad user experience where they're using the scroll bar in the pop-up to view the table. Um, this is how the transit stops look originally. When you bring in the data into the map viewer, uh, you go to change style, which is where smart mapping is found, and you explore the data this way. And so if I'm interested in uh, all weekday activity, this is the thought process that I went through while creating this map. I want to show it by color. And the, the, one of the stops has about 58,000 people going on and off of it every day. Uh, but I want to zoom in to view the histogram a little bit better. Um, so the average is around 178 people per stop. I've changed the theme to above and below. So I want to see everything above the average in, let's say, this purple to green color uh, in green, and everything below the average in this purple. Now, if, if I was interested in seeing only the higher values, I simply slide it up and then see that downtown Los Angeles is the one that has over 50,000 people taking the bus. Um, and then for the HTML pop-up, this was the final product. Uh, you simply go into the configure pop-up, and there's this HTML button at the top left. And you go in and you put, put in your HTML table. All right, so clustering really can make a difference in your mapping, and it's one click of a button and sliding that slider around to see which settings work best for your data. I like that. You don't have to map every dot. We for, you have permission not to map every single dot. <laughs> Clustering is your friend. Yeah, so mapping what is a dimension of features, um, type, name, class, district, territory. Um, and you can also do it in 3D, so different types of pipes, water pipes, sewage line, or, and then Miami-Dade, different types of zoning. Notice here in 3D, the object itself often is the symbol. It's not being abstracted away. The pipe is actually colored yellow because we want you to see it. The buildings in yellow are colored that color for a specific reason. And the size of the building carries, I guess, the um, implication of how big uh, that structure is, mm -hmm. how much zoning or square footage. Yeah, so we change something and immediately the map responds. We didn't have to get out of smart mapping. We're seeing the changes instantly. It gives you immediate feedback, and really interesting stories appear when you start to use these different types of rendering styles with smart mapping. All right, so that's mapping uh, where and what. The third section in purple is mapping how much. So the era of dumb defaults is ending. 
Uh, mapping how much is things like totals, percentages, rates, mapping averages or medians and ratios. You can show it by color, you can show it by size, or you can show it by both color and size. So some examples are map mapping population clusters or elevation around a mountain or energy score by building and collision warnings um, aggregating the points into hex, hex bins. So I'm gonna show energy score. This is the final app that came out of this and you know, it shows the energy score has a grade for every single building. So an A building receives this blue, A and B, and then C and D receives these white color. And then these ghost looking buildings have no data. So we still include it, but we kind of fade it into the background. Now, the point of showing this is to show that smart mapping works in 3D as well. So here we have our, our, um, our original layer, and we go into the attribute that we're interested in, the star score. And here we have this histogram that you saw earlier. Uh, I know that a 90 and above is an A, and maybe a 20 and below is failing, the average score is about a 50, and we can change the color as well, uh, flip the ramp around. And so now we have something that's very similar to what you just saw in the app. The only difference is that here we, we can add edges. So depending on what you want for your map. Jennifer, if you were in a meeting um, helping someone understand this data, maybe they've never mapped it for the first time, mm -hmm. It, what if they said something like, we've been thinking about changing the threshold for you know, the grades from what they are now to something different. We were thinking a score of 50 mm -hmm. is significant. Yeah, so 50 and above or 50 and below is not good. Then we can move this up and say, okay, if, if you are now a white building, you need to improve. So we didn't have to go rebuild anything. Uh, republish anything or, yeah. or recache anything. We we're able to interact with it live. And that's something we have found is invaluable when you're in meetings and people kind of challenge the map they're looking at or they challenge the numbers that are used in the map or they just want to discuss, well, how, you know, maybe our goal is unreasonable. Mm -hmm. You know, show me all the areas, uh, all the buildings that are within 10 points of getting an A and you can easily um, do that kind of thing. I've got another example of uh, mapping how much. How much effort will it take for me to mount, uh, hike around Mount St. Helens? That's Mount St. Helens in the middle. This is called the Lewitt Trail. And we've got a data set of uh, GPS points all the way around at track points that if I hit play, uh, you're gonna kind of see people leaving the parking lot um, and then hiking around the trail. These are one hour increments. So that must be a flat piece of land. That looks like a little bit. And then here's a big descent. And then here's a big ascent. And we started thinking about, well, what else, uh, how much time or how much elevation changes over time? And the, one of the first maps we made was just simply um, to show in color as you climb to higher elevation, red indicates you're at a higher elevation. And as you fade to yellow, there's a big descent. And then here we're climbing again. And that was kind of interesting, um, you know, the way we might do that in um, combining animation with uh, a smart mapping style. We just pick the elevation figure from the GPX points and um, we go to the color style. And you can see from the histogram that the average GPX point is at 1,255 meters. So if I wanted to see, show me all the areas that are above the average, I might drag that up there and hit play, and then I would just understand when am I above 1,200 meters. Um, what I wanted to do in this case was have a kind of a full spread and, uh, and experience that. And then apart from animating it, what if we just look at, um, at the, oh, I, the way I wanted to show this, sorry, was to pull this time period all the way open. Now I see the entire trail, the red areas I'm at elevation, and then I can kind of see towards the end, I'm descending back down to the parking lot. Um, started to cause us to ask other questions like, hey, what was the change in elevation from point to point? Uh, maybe I'll turn off the dark terrain. And so uh, areas in purple, we were gaining uh, a one meter or losing one meter or more. Areas in orange, we were gaining one meter or more, right? And notice what's happening in the histogram. 
Anyone got a guess why the histogram looks bimodal? There's almost no values near zero. Any guess? If you guessed that I got tired of rendering no change in slope, you're correct. So I weeded out all those points where we gained less than a half meter or descended less than a half meter, because I figured that's about flat, right, from point to point. And that reduced the number of features we had to draw. And then lastly, we were curious about, you know, could we actually measure the um, change in slope from GPX point to GPX point? And this map shows the one part of the trail I'd probably hate the most, where we're going to, you know, we're walking this way. Blue indicates constant descent, descent, descent. And then we turn a corner and it's all ascent. And it's about a 500 meter change. Um, the way this got calculated, because we were curious, we have the elevation. Um, we wanted to know, you know, GPX doesn't tell me slope along the way, but I could derive it. So we put it into an expression. I'll just show it here, where we go get the current feature, right, in the first line. And then we do some work to go find the previous feature based on time. Um, and then we do a simple calculation of the distance between one point and another. And then um, we know that, and we know the elevation change, which we previously uh, calculated. So it's just rise over run. And that gives me a rough estimate of slope. It's not the same type of slope calculation that people who build trails use. But it is just sort of useful for us that we could explore the data a little bit and ask yet one more question, use Arcade to calculate one additional field, and then um, start to visualize that map, see how it adds value. Mm -hmm. And I think this map also has uh, time. Does it have a time element to it? Like what time she was at each point around the trail? Oh, yeah. That's where the animation data is coming from on the track points. So down here in the data, we've got um, The time for yeah. each one. A lot of our layers that we work with have dates associated with them. When did the accident occur? Where, where was she and when was she at this point? Um, and so smart mapping has a time rendering style. So you can map um, age. Uh, how long was it since, uh, how long has it been since the last inspection at this location, that's for example? This yeah, that's this one. Is so that? hours from the start of the hike is an expression. Um, that we, we, in this case, chose to actually just calculate it straight out. Yeah. Cool. All right, so in review for the mapping how much, you can use size, color, transparency to emphasize what's important and de-emphasize what's not important. Like in the 3D maps of New York, the buildings that didn't have data, they were still there, but they were transparent. Um, so it emphasized the buildings that actually had a score. Uh, we can map uh, counts to reveal interesting patterns. And these are maps of percentages, rates, ratios, other normalized data. All right, so third section out of five. Uh, the green section is mapping relationships in your data. So how does one value or variable relate to another attribute? And some examples that we'll show um, uninsured people, drinkers and smokers, commute alternatives. So we'll go into that. And we'll start with the uninsured map. Yeah, good. What you're looking at is uh, Houston, Texas. And we're showing on this map the uh, centroids of all these census tracts. This is coming from the American Community Survey from the census, the latest year available. And we're showing the percentage of the population with no health insurance. So redder areas have um, up to, uh, uh, sorry, red areas have 17, 18% of the population without insurance or more. And then the size of the dot indicates, you know, how big the community is. In this case, there's uh, 5,200 people here. And uh, this pop-up is very nice. It kind of breaks down the insurance, um, of people without health insurance by age group. So we can kind of drill into it a little bit. And then what's interesting about this, um, we're showing the relationship between two attributes. Oftentimes we'll make a map of, uh, you know, we were all taught in, in cartography classes that, uh, you know, if you're gonna make a map of a subject, you know, try to normalize it somehow, you know, uh, population per square mile or um, 
percent of uninsured. And that way you can smear that color all across the entire census tract, no matter how small that census tract is in an urban area or how large that census tract is in a rural area. They all get the same color, right? Um, an advantage of showing um, two attributes, the percent and the count together, is that you get the color pattern and you get an idea of um, the count of people affected. So in this area of Houston, there's just 365 people, about 10% of the population without. And over here, there's about 4,000 people without insurance. So you get a visual, it's almost like looking at uh, a grapevine with, uh, you see clusters of grapes, and you can see which grapes are ripe and ready to be picked and which are still developing and which have died and they're withered on the vine, right? That's kind of the, this grape style. Um, when you dive into the data a little bit, again, you get a histogram that you can zoom in on and kind of look at, okay, most census tracts in this uh, US data set um, have about 10% uninsured. But what if someone asked a question, you know, what does it look like if we map the map and the only census tracts that get red color would be those census tracts where 100% of the people have no insurance? Now, how likely is that? It's not too likely, so maybe we should do it at 50%. Um, we can pop out and um, um, talk to a subject matter expert and try to get an understanding. What you need to know from smart mapping perspective is when you pick a style, as soon as you, you know, touch one of these things, it goes in and it picks one standard deviation below the mean, and here's the mean, and one standard deviation above the mean. So you always have a, a decent starting point for what is the default style that absent any other input, the smart mapping um, algorithm is gonna suggest this is a reasonable place to start based on what the data is saying. And then your step is to get the subject matter expert involved. And what we'll often do is we'll put the pop-up up and we'll even do the style of pop-up where it's just rows and columns of data and we'll, we'll say to them, hey, um, what is interesting in here when it comes to, what do I need to know about percent uninsured? and just open-ended questions, and then often I'll literally hand the mouse to the subject matter expert and make them drive the map. Because when they have to interact with the data and they have to explain it, and now you're just like a journalist, you're just recording, what did she say? And oftentimes that's uh, inspiration for the pop-up. Um, and they might say something interesting like, well, I know nationwide it's 10% you know, average, but re really most policymakers are looking at taking action anywhere that 25% above or above is, um, is happening. So suddenly this map becomes very relevant. Looks like we have a lot of work to do in Houston with regard to um, health insurance. Now our next example is kind of a fun one. Um, do we have any drinkers in the room? Any smokers in the room? Mm. Only a handful of hands went up there, okay, I see how it is. This is a bivariate style that um, we call it the relationship style at ArcGIS Online. Um, it's right here, anytime you pick two rates, um, you've got a chance to do a relationship style map. And um, if we didn't have a relationship style map, what might we do? I might, uh, here, I'll just copy this layer for a second. And we might make a map of, uh, let's get rid of one of these. So we might make a map of one attribute, percent smokers, and the map enhances, and then we'll copy it again. And this time, I'm gonna change it from smokers to, uh, I think it's called excessive drinkers. Yeah, there it is, percent excessive drinking. So this is from the CDC. And we might make these two maps, right? And even if you did accept the defaults, which I never recommend, you should always look at the defaults and then start to ask questions. But check this out. So this is uh, smokers, drinkers. Smokers, drinkers. Anyone notice kind of a pattern? It's kind of difficult to notice a pattern when you're looking at two maps separately. And that's why sometimes using the two attributes you're interested in and just choosing them. As soon as you choose these two things, you can choose the relationship style if it makes sense. Is there a relationship between drinking and smoking? Yeah, maybe anecdotally. I mean, it's not a scientific relationship, is it? But if you're a public health official and you've got initiatives dealing with excessive drinking and you've got initiatives dealing with excessive smoking, 
you might want to dig into this data to, again, take a look at the histogram, take a look at the defaults that are suggested, and understand how a relationship map works. If I say the only way you can get the extreme colors is if you're a true outlier, notice how all the message in the map went away. Every county's normal, right? Everything is awesome. It's when we put meaning into those values that suddenly the map will snap it to attention and uh, start to deliver some value. Um, the last little thing I'll note on here is when you edit the legend right here, that's your chance to kind of change these words from high, high to, um, you know, lots of drinking and smoking. far less drinking and smoking, and et cetera. And then what we usually recommend on these dimensions, so as you go this direction, the orange indicates high drinking. So we might say lots of drinking. And on this one, it's more about smoking. That's maybe a better way. So wordsmith this in the way that makes sense for your audience. Um, And as a result, now you have kind of a legend that maybe is a little more addressable than a legend that says high, high, low, low. So your part in this process is essential. The smart mapping can only make suggestions based on the attributes you choose. Um, and you don't want to put in you know, percent rainfall and percent smokers, right? Rainfall has little to do probably with smoking. The software doesn't know that, but you do. So you are responsible for whatever you choose to put in with two attributes. And you know that. So this map shows if you are not going to drive alone to work, commute alternatives. So if you're taking, uh, if you're walking, taking the bus or carpooling, what's the most common distribution around the city? So in downtown LA, it's mostly walking if, it, if you're not going to drive. And if, it, if you're maybe in the blue area, you're taking the bus, et cetera. So notice how the text changes as I'm clicking throughout the map. Uh, this is done with arcade expressions and something we highly recommend, which is uh, taking away the work from the viewer of having to look at the legend and interpret what each color means, uh, have it in the, in the pop-up, have the color in the text of the pop-up match the actual map to reinforce the meaning. Uh, let's go over to Portland, Oregon. And then notice as we've got lots of the copies of the layer on the left, notice as I zoom in, different symbols start to appear. And so this is another way to reiterate the meaning of your map. So now people don't have to click on the pop-up to view that this color means walking. We already have a symbol of someone walking, driving, taking the bus, or biking. And so this is what we call um, like scale-dependent symbology. So as we zoom in, the symbology changes. As we zoom out, um, the symbols disappear because if we zoom out and there's a bunch of symbols at the national level, you won't be able to see the story. Um, so the way we do this pop-up is by going into configure pop-up. And I have two arcade expressions. So in your pop-up, there's the attribute expression section. And you hit add and this pop-up builder uh, appears. So for predominant category, uh, we, we put all the features in, we do this expression that, that shows the output of the most common category. And so if it's this category, return the word carpooling, et cetera. And now to change the color, we say, okay, well, if carpooling one, make it red. If bus one, make it this hex color here, uh, and then you, you simply put it into your expression in the HTML. So in the HTML, there's a font color, and you put in expression one as the font color. And there's lots of blogs about this, and um, you'll get the slides so you can go into these maps and look at the expression and copy and paste it to use in your mapping. All right, so let's move on. So that's mapping relationships, um, the combination or the relationship between two variables. You can do ratios, compare A to B, color and size, predominance, 
lots to choose from. So uh, relationships are rate and account, or a dimension and a measure, two measures, most predominance are most common. So like an election map would be a predominance map, which, which political party won the most votes, for example. So fourth section, the last section is in orange, map data that does not exist. So this is my favorite section out of all of them because I love arcade expressions. Um, sometimes you, you go to open data, uh, you go to Living Atlas, you find data that's not your own. You bring it into your map and you say, oh, we have the count, but I wanted to get the percentage. Or we have this in feet, but I want it in meters. But you don't own the data and you can't change it. Well, now with arcade, you can. Yeah, so the old ways, we, if you did own the data, you'd add the field, you calculate it. Um, now it's on the fly. And so it's really fun and flexible. So mapping data that does not exist will show a few of these examples. Uh, the first one is on vehicle collisions. Yeah, good. This, uh, this one is a kind of a neat example. We've all seen data sets like this, with tons and tons of points. This is LA collisions from uh, the LA um, hub. And it's just a bunch of points, right? And if I click, I don't know, here, I just clicked on 44 collisions in that one little spot. So we might start out by thinking, well, let's, let's heat map it. That's a, always a good place to go with dots, just to kind of see where are things stacking up. And when you take this top handle in heat mapping, you can kind of see what effect it has. It just has the effect of um, broadening, you know, what's the area of influence? In other words, uh, how close together do the points have to be in order for me to assign this yellow color, right? And right away, what do you kind of notice in this data set? You notice a grid pattern? What about a street network suggest a grid, and why would accidents tend to appear where two roads meet? Right? Collisions, traffic collisions, people running red lights or making left turns when it wasn't expected, things like that. So we started to think about, well, in my head, I don't have the data I want. Showing this map isn't what is as useful as possible for perhaps someone who um, is uh, in traffic control. They want to know, how do real people talk about their neighborhood? They talk about crime on the streets. They talk about traffic safety on the streets. So what if we could map the streets based on these collisions? Or what if we could highlight the dangerous streets? the more collision-prone streets so that we can take action. I think that's what gets us excited about um, these mapping techniques is not just map it so it looks good, but also do some analysis. So I just want to take you through how this works. In um, this case, we're not going to use Arcade, but we are going to use some ready-to-use tools in ArcGIS Online called uh, Summarize Data. And I can either summarize within or summarize nearby. I can take my collisions and uh, I'm going to say the street center line will be the thing I'm, um, what does it say? Choose layer from which distances will be measured to features in the layer to summarize. So uh, this always confuses me. <laughs> I got to do it this way, right? Choose a layer to summarize. I'm summarizing collisions near the street center lines, also coming from open data. And I'm going to say, uh, give me the straight line distance of, uh, you know, if you're within 50 feet of a street, you know, depending on how these coordinates are getting recorded, I think that'll be good. And if I wanted to, I could summarize some of the other data. Um, for expediency, I'm just going to say go. Um, it's off and running. I didn't have to install anything. I just grabbed the street line, center lines from open data. I grabbed the collisions from open data. I put them in, and it's going to go calculate that. So you can watch that spin. But in the meanwhile, um, what I did with the result, once you have the uh, sum of the, oh, I actually, in this case, I sum the number killed and the number injured. Um, but you also have a sum of the points in this data set. And that's all we're mapping. We're saying, take the streets and go find, um, I could just find the collisions, right? And just the count per road segment. But not all road segments are equal. And this is a truth you will find in thematic mapping your whole life. It is rare that the thing you are thematic mapping, that the data units themselves are in any way equal. And that's true with road segments too. So it makes it harder to normalize if the objects themselves are of varying length and size. You know, you really have to get engaged. So I thought, OK, I'll take the count of points, and I'll do this little function called length. Arcade has this 
function called uh, length that will um, determine the length of an object and return it in uh, miles. So I've got the number of uh, accidents or collisions per mile in my map. And there's our friend, the histogram, who's here to help to tell me that the average street segment in this data set experiences 262 collisions per mile. So that's a lot. I see my data returned and is covering up my stuff, so I'm gonna go back in here. Um, but here's what I want you to notice. See that outlier at the top? Somewhere there's a street segment that has 3,242 collisions per mile, and uh, I've only got 18 points of width to show it, so it's probably somewhere over here. But watch what happens when you don't let the outliers drive your map. You start to get more and more signal, as we like to call it, from the map. So if I were to set you're gonna get an 18 point wide symbol if you are at the average 262. Let's do 262. All those streets that are thick, they're above average, right? And we learned something from that. Or maybe I wanna say, what's about twice average? About 500. Maybe I like round numbers for the sake of presentations. But then the next level is to kind of say, well, that's nice and all, but where should I focus my work? Where is it really unusual? And that's where we started to symbolize based on um, color and size. The color is the collisions per mile, the expression, and the size is just based on the width. I use the above and below style, right? That's this one and a color palette where I wanna create kind of an alarming color on top, so maybe just for the sake of this demo, I'll switch to this uh, pink and green. And then uh, I've anchored the map at about the same value. I'll put it at literally the same value, 262. And this is one standard deviation above and below the mean. So now I've got a, a basis to go into the traffic engineering or talk with the policymakers about, well, yeah, we're trying to work not only on potholes in LA, but we also wanna work on making the streets safer. If you wanna target your funds, I suggest the thicker pink streets get your attention first, mm -hmm. right? And that's uh, um, the example that I wanted to show, um, kind of a little bit of arcade with a little bit of calculation. Yeah, that's, that color ramp is a little more uh, colorblind friendly. I think one in seven men are colorblind. And so a lot of the ramps that we've added to smart mapping are colorblind friendly. Uh, we use a software called Oracle that uh, changes the, the look of your screen to, to simulate what it looks like to a colorblind person. So we try to make it as accessible as possible. So this is a map. It's, we've shown a lot of LA maps. I wanted to show more of a global look of what is the most common livestock in each country. So we can make maybe six different maps of all the sheep in the world and all the cattle and all the goat, or you could put it all into one. So we see in the you know, North and South America, it's mostly cattle. Uh, North Africa and the Middle East, lots of sheep. Uh, Eastern Asia, lots of duck. Uh, and so let me show you how to create a map like this. So we have all the um, fields here, but if we just start with one, maybe buffalo, uh, we're presented with a, a counts and amounts or a size map. And we see that there's a lot of buffalo in India. We can also use the counts and amounts, but notice how now China and India look equal. Uh, that's the power of using size with your counts. You'd now see a huge difference between those two countries. When we add a second attribute, for example, cattle or cows, and now we see um, we can compare A to B, the ratio, which one has more or less. Then we add another attribute. Uh, let's add, let's say, chicken. So see how smart mapping is changing depending on what attributes you're adding. So it's smart enough to see, uh, well, maybe you want a predominance map, which one, which country has the most of these three, or show the predominance by size. And so we continue to add uh, up to 10 attributes. If you want to add more, you can use arcade expressions. And so we'll add up to 10. Let's see. That's a lot of That's, chickens in China. It's a lot. And so here's the final map that I have the pop-up um, generated with. And so if we look at each one, notice two things. Uh, the picture changes with the text, and all the colors change as well, like you saw on the other map. And the second thing on the bottom right, we have this ordered list. Uh, so that changes based on what is clicked. 
And so I'll show you how to do those two things. Back in the configure pop-up, we have that predominant um, arcade that I showed earlier. Uh, the difference is that you can add a link to an image. And then from there, in the HTML, there's an image section. And you would put that expression as the image source. Uh, the second thing is the ordered list. So we have our livestock array that we've created that is a group of pigs, cattle, chickens, etc. I created my own function called compare livestock. So it looks through each of those and says, okay, which one has the most? And it outputs this, this sort function. So if you look up a function, there's the information about it that tells you, you know, how to make it. Uh, you can also click on that function and it inputs it straight into your expression. Um, so I have my array of all the animals, and then I put in my function, the compare livestock function. The output is another array of the list of, of the ordered list. So the one in the first position at zero, position zero, this is the output of my, um, my pop-up. If you test it, you can see at the bottom. And we have this text function that converts the um, number to a string. So a lot of times we have um, a string field that we want to convert to a number and vice versa. So the number function and the text function are very useful in that, in that sense. And then, oh yeah. And then what I want to make a comment here, the thing I really love about the pop-up itself when you show that, um, part of the reason Jennifer is very successful um, in, her, in her work is she, as she explored the data and realized, you know, having eight, 10 columns of data to look through, I mean, it's a lot for somebody to absorb. She didn't just report the data in a rows and columns style pop-up. And she didn't just list sheep, cattle, pigs with their numbers. She went the next step and thought, what would they want to know? They probably want to know what's number one and then what's number two, number three, four, five. So that ordered list is that extra little touch that um, we find is part of smart mapping the data exploration, realizing what is it going to take to explain this concept to somebody and what interaction would they like, a lot of times developers are the first place we go to come up with these concepts. So the fact that she can do this in Arcade, me, it catches my attention. I'm like, so why isn't that just in the product? Right. And that's the next conversation we'll go have. And that's, that's how we all interact with you in sort of this ecosystem is as you come up with great ideas, we'd love to hear them, see them, talk to, talk to us about why you did it that way and why it's valuable. Yeah, that's what's next in the defaults is when you make a predominance map, it'll auto-generate a predominance pop-up for you. So right now we're making it on our own, but in the next few releases we're going to uh, have that option. So this map looks a little familiar to the one Jim showed, but this one is showing power plants across the globe. And uh, the newest feature in Arcade is called Feature Sets. And what's really powerful about Feature Sets is that you can have one layer, so I have my country boundary. There's no information in it, just the boundary of every country. And I want to click on that layer, the country layer, and I want the pop-up to pull in information from another layer in the map. So that's very new. Um, so for example, if you click on Brazil, it's calculating how many power plants are in that country. And if I change that power plants layer, this is automatically updated. Oh, yay! Hey, got a clap, all right. <laughs> yes. Um, so in Brazil, there's 2,292. Anyone want to guess how many are in the US? Anyone? Let's see? I thought I guess 7,000. Well, you knew the answer. Well, nobody guessed, so I'm, I'm in. 7,000. I guess 1,000. Hey, almost eight. So uh, if you go to configure pop-up again, this is where I'm living these days, uh, you can create a feature set here. So the grayed out is the comments on how to do this. So later when you look at the map, it explains it a little bit better. But there's pretty much two steps to the feature sets. Uh, one, this is my country layer, by the way. So I need to call or reference the other layer, the power plants layer. And the way you do that is you create a variable plants. And you go to your web map, expand it, and you find the layer that you're interested in. So I'm interested in the power plants layer. So just two clicks, and now we have this variable set. And then the second step is uh, intersecting. So tell me, uh, show me all the power plants that intersect with Brazil for example, and then use the count function, okay, of all the ones that are intersecting, count them up for me. 
and return plants per, per country. And what's nice about Arcade is that you can change the values, uh, the tester values here. So if you change this and test it, uh, you can see the difference uh, in the values. That's really cool. Then th th this short circuits in the old days, what would we have to do? If somebody came to us and said, hey, I love your map of power plants. Can you get a count in every, mm -hmm. we would say, sure, we're going to go offline to our desktop. We're going to do the overlay, do the count, republish this country boundary with an updated count. Yeah, it changes, well, the power plants don't change every day, but they come on and offline every day. Um, so we would be concerned that we can't go off cycle that much. Uh, we really like the fact that uh, now a true WebGIS pattern, we can just query this layer and get an answer back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if someone else owns the power plant layer and they update it, then your map is automatically updated. Uh, this is a similar example using feature sets. So we've got congressional district boundaries across the US, and I'm interested in how many federal lands are within each district. And so similar to the power plant example, we, we do the intersect, we count how many are intersected, uh, but we can take it a step further and show the different types of federal lands or the different types of power plants and how many uh, there are in each boundary. And then lastly, to end on a fun note, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. Winter is coming and Game of Thrones is coming next month. Uh, so I made this, I found this map and then I added some symbols to it, dragon sightings, for example. And so it's using feature sets to calculate how many cities, towns, castles, and dragon sightings there are in each continent. So it's, it's using the same um, idea that we were showing earlier to reiterate, um, configure pop-up, you add your expression, so this continent layer is calling the dragon sighting layer, and then we found the intersect in the count. So it's a very simple example. You can go um, pretty detailed with arcade expression. Is that an authoritative source of dragon sightings? Do you cite your source? Yeah, I saw them myself. OK. All right, first hand. <laughs> Good. First hand account. So that's mapping data that does not exist. You get to be a mapping wizard with arcade. So. Uh, to recap, it allows you to um, view data that you might not have had access to before. And you can also show age and lots of ways to view relationships and data that does not exist. So what's next? Um, I suggest that you know, look up smart mapping, or if you're interested in the JavaScript, everything that we showed is available in the JavaScript API. There's free training, learn ArcGIS lessons, books, videos, and blogs. Yeah, that smart mapping page, esri.com slash smart mapping, that's the place to send your staff to go look at. There's 10 two-minute videos that show various examples, kind of like what we showed here, of how to make a simple, effective map quickly in minutes. And it's a way of kind of extending your reach within the organization. Um, if, if people can author web maps for you and hand it to you or your developers to implement, you're kind of uh, uh, accelerating the path through which you're um, leveraging all your data and, ex and finding the things you need to find. All right, so please take our survey on the app. It only takes a couple minutes. Um, we love reading. We, see, we get to see your comments, and so it helps us prepare for the next year, what you want to see, what you liked, what you didn't like, and it keeps us in the job, too. <laughs> Any questions we can take uh, in a, yeah. So the question is, um, he's seen a lot of um, workshops on arcade expressions and feature sets, and he's seen it mostly with points and polygons, but the question is, will the feature sets work with lines for intersect, and is there a distance feature? Um, so with lines, if you have a polygon, you want to count how many lines are in it? Um, or I'm doing a line against a line, so that... Oh, which lines are close to each other? Yes. Is there a distance feature? I'll go look, but uh, I'll have an answer by the time you leave. Yeah, because I know for, we'll look that up, but for the line and the polygon, if the line is intersecting, um, there is a function that cuts it. And so you can measure the distance 
for the intersect, but we'll find out the answer for the lines. It's very new, so we're still exploring it ourselves, too. Good question. Yes? On the crash map, that you were showing, uh, one is the analysis cost credits, and then two, does the data get appended to, that, to your feature set, or how is that data maintained from the presentation of the map? Sure. So the question is, um, with the cl uh, vehicle collisions map we showed earlier, Jim did an analysis that said summarize nearby. And the question is, does it cost credits? Uh, yes, it does, but merely since um, it shows you how many credits it costs. Uh, and then the second part of the question was, are the of the oh, are, the are the results appended to the original data? Um, no, you can, but the result is an output of a new layer. But you can append that layer to the original if you wanted to. So yeah, results are written out as a new layer. So you've got your original plus this copy of it with these additional attributes that you summarized. Um, and the credits, yeah, it does cost something. Um, I always recommend to people just try to figure out the equivalent cost of your time to do it some other method um, and try to make the decision based on, you know, rule of thumb is if it's in the ballpark, it might be faster. And But I know sometimes about people have different access to credits. So. Yeah, sometimes if it's a huge feature, I'll bring it into desktop and run it there and republish it. Or override it. Do you want to take it or do you want me to? Yeah, what was the question though? <laughs> okay, so I'll reiterate the question. Yeah. So uh, she was very impressed with the traffic collisions layer and how we had that line. So we had a street segment, and in that street segment we had how many collisions there were. And we, if there were a lot of collisions on that street, it would be a thick line. And if there weren't too many, it'd be a thin line. And only a segment. Yeah. And so um, you're saying that you have long streets, so you want to cut it by intersection? Mm -hmm. We joined it. We joined the two layers, so that's how that's how it works. Uh, we joined them by using the analysis tool. And then, if you wanted to have greater detail, you could you could clip the intersection to make it a smaller, or clip the road to make it a smaller road segments, and then show it from there. Yeah, let's let's show that. Uh, sure, just real quick, you you pick any field. Uh, you try. <laughs> um, and uh, in this case, let's turn this one off and this one on real quick. And the field I'm choosing, let's go back to something, um, the sum of in number injured. Sorry if this is a difficult topic. Um, so now I'm symbolizing which street segments had greater numbers of people injured. And by touching this, I can change it from being outlier driven to more, you know, now it's showing in thickness all the streets that had above average. The average is about 20. Maybe I want to say, well, let's let's only reward the extreme streets, right? And it, as you kind of move this around, we've all been making maps this way forever. It's just we didn't have a slider bar to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of try to figure out what is the point of the map. What's the purpose of the map I'm creating? Am I trying to show the extremes? Or am I trying to show where these are all the streets that are above a threshold? And that's the whole point of kind of saying, you know, sometimes one color isn't as good as a color where everything above the average is in a stark red color. These are the streets you need to be talking about first. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Joined first. Yeah. I'm, that's a good point. I should have said when you do the analysis up here, and you say summarize, you know, points with lines, it automatically joins the results to the lines. That's my bad, yeah. Cool.
So we're happy to stay up here and answer more questions, um, but I know some people, it's past 11, so we'll, we'll be here to answer more questions. And thank you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Happy napping. Yeah.